Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us uh, for the um, third installment of uh, NYC Audubon's 2023 to 2024 le Winter Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Rosalind Rivas, my pronouns are she, her, and I am NYC Audubon's Public Programs Manager. Um, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. Uh, our winter lecture series takes place every year from November to March. We invite five speakers of various backgrounds to give an online talk about their areas of expertise. This year's theme is Narratives in Nature, in which we showcase speakers who highlight their identity in their work. For those who are not familiar with New York City Audubon and what we do, we are a grassroots conservation nonprofit that works to protect wild birds and their habitat in New York City. We work to make the city a more bird-friendly place through uh, engagement, conservation, and advocacy. Those are our three pillars. Through engagement, um, we aim to foster an appreciation for birds and nature in the people of the city, inspiring them to uh, take conservation action. In addition to the lectures like these, we host hundreds of bird outings, classes, workshops, and festivals every year. Our conservation work involves bird and biodiversity monitoring um, of various community science projects. I'm actually going to drop the links to both those things right here in the chat. Just hold on one sec. All right. Um, but to continue with conservation, uh, you can check out our conservation webpage for more info about how you can volunteer with us. And you'll hear more about conservation work in tonight's event, especially about raptors or birds of prey. If, if the legislative side of making NYC more bird friendly is more your speed, you should learn more about our advocacy work on our website as well. To learn how to make immediate civic action to uh, uh, take place, take action um, in a uh, civic engagement to protect birds in NYC, such as writing to elected officials or volunteering at outreach events. You can even become an avian advocate. Um, more info on that on this page, which I'll share right now. All right, first I'll put down engagement. Here we go, right here. Sorry about that, got turned around for a bit, okay. That's our engagement page. This is our conservation page. And advocacy, specifically our avian advocates page. We're kind of revamping that program right now. All right. As many out there know, we are changing our name, dropping the Audubon to create a more inclusive and welcoming environment for all New Yorkers. We are so, so close to deciding our new name and we will announce it in March. So stay tuned for that. We're down to our top five names. Uh, though our email, though our name will change, our work to protect birds and engage New Yorkers will stay just as it's always been. For more information about the decision and the renaming process, please visit our website at the link, at this link right here, which I'll drop now in the chat. Before moving on to the rest of the program tonight, Quick reminder that all of the lectures in this, in this series will be recorded and later posted on our website for anyone to view. Closed captioning is enabled for the Zoom and in the recording, and we will be sharing the recording with everyone who registered later this week. During tonight's lecture, please type any questions you have in the Q&A, and I will read them aloud to our speaker. You can open this Zoom feature by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. After the film screening, we will take as many questions as we can. We've allotted a lot of time for them because we know that the problem will be a lot. <laughs> and we also wanna send a huge, huge thank you to Claude and Lucien Bloch, whose continued support has made our lecture series possible. So our speaker tonight is Sean Hayes, a world-renowned falconer and raptor conservationist. His interest in birds started at a young age of eight years old um, in Southern California, where he acquired his first hawk. For the past three decades, Sean has resided in the Eastern Sierras in the areas of Bishop and Mammoth Lakes, California, a perfect area where he has access to the many acres of public land to enjoy his practice of falconry, along with raptor and bird watching. Sean is recognized for his ability to build relationships with the falcons he handles, flies, and hunts. For the falcons he trains, he strives to create a flying style close to how falcons stop, fly and hunt in the wild. His greatest enjoyment is simply watching his falcons fly. Sean feels a sense of urgency to educate falconers and non-falconers alike about these challenges raptors face, such as loss of habitat and dimin diminishing food supply. 
With his many years of experience, he has been invited to travel the world, sharing his knowledge on both falconry and raptor conservation. Sean's life and falconry are chronicled in two films, The Perfect Flight by Speculative, Speculative Films and Game Hawker Patagonia Films. With his sense of adventure and connection to nature, he continues to inspire others to break the boundaries of who belongs outdoors. So before we hear from Sean directly, we will stream the latter of the two films I just mentioned, Game Hawker. This short film was created in 2022 through Patagonia by filmmakers Shosh Eisenberg and Gr Brett Marty. In it, you'll get a glimpse of Sean Hayes' life and work as a falconer and American falconry ambassador, which take him all over the world. To quote the synopsis on Patagonia's website, this film is about more than what humans can train birds to do. It's about what those birds can teach us about living in partnership with wild creatures and wild places. So without further ado, here is Game Hawker. I am going to share my screen right now and stream the film. Hold on one sec. The whole film is approximately 20 minutes. So after that, we will be able to hear from Sean himself for Q and A. All right. Okay. Link screen. The commitment to being a game hawker is big. This is a way of life. Falconry gets its hooks into you so deeply. Falconry is just this deep attachment to the bird. We're attracted to animals that are powerful. People want to get close to that. People think this is just such a romantic thing to do. They don't realize how difficult it is. It's a lifestyle. I mean, it's just like having a child. It consumes all your time if you're going to do it right. You've invested so much in this bird developing its potential that it just becomes all-consuming. And before you know it, this has taken over your entire life. This is the first book that I read on Falcon. I actually couldn't read it because I didn't, I was so young, I didn't understand it. I made the equipment out of one of my mom's old purses, the Jesses, you know, the lures and the leashes and stuff like that. So this is the book by E.B. Mitchell. When I was visiting Pakistan, local falconers gave me a setup. This is the style of equipment they use to go to another country and to see different types of falconry equipment is really interesting. They want me to use these things, but they're so nice, I'm, <laughs> I get a, I kind of get afraid to use them. When I train any bird, I really like to build a relationship with those birds. I really like to make that bird feel comfortable with me. You can't discipline a falcon. Falcons don't react the same way a cat or a dog would. It's definitely not a pet relationship unless you're the pet. You put out a lot of effort and you get, you know, very, very small rewards. You can't hunt or fly your birds if you don't have a healthy bird. I will make sure that their mutes, their droppings look good, so I know that their food is being passed. And then I weigh them. <laughs> to make sure he's at a good flying weight condition. Stay there, it's okay. All 
I write down the things that I like to know when I'm out training my bird. He flew 1,000 feet, and he caught that duck, and his weight was 800 grams, and the temperature was 25 degrees. When we're hunting, it's a lot more difficult than you think. It's not like when a person has a gun, they can shoot five ducks in an afternoon. The game that I hunt with my birds are designed to escape. How you doing, buddy? It's extremely difficult to train and develop a bird to catch stuff from over 1,500, 2,000 feet. And that's where I want my birds to fly. Come on. Come on. If you're putting your bird up in really terrible places and there's no game, they'll just go, well, this guy's a terrible hunter. I don't want anything to do with them. They'll just fly away and <laughs> you know, go off hunting by themselves. So you have to demonstrate to the bird how good you are and your effectiveness. There's a lot to falconry. And the most important thing is conservation. I get my birds from the wild and captive breeding. Here in the United States, we're allowed to trap migrating birds. A lot of the birds that migrate die. 80% of those birds die. So when you put those young birds into the hands of a falconer, and the falconer is able to teach that bird how to hunt, you know that bird's gonna survive. I like to instill into my birds that wild mentality. You know, you don't hunt, you don't eat. You don't work, you don't get paid because that's what they go through in the wild. I hope you guys got that. She took advantage of the height and her speed, and she dropped her lower feet and she hit it right in between the neck and the head. I'm transferring her off this duck with this pigeon meat, she won't know the difference. And I'm kind of somewhat regulating what I'm giving her. It's amazing that I'm here with a wild creature. And I just witnessed this bird do something that it's naturally gonna do, whether I had it or not. And it just, it still blows me away that I'm able to do that. Are you good? I may not, you know, have the, the fattest wallet, you know, when I look at the mountains and Mount Tom and the, and the whites, it's, it's actually, uh, it, it, it's, it's cool to me. <laughs> I can look at these mountains every day and find something beautiful about them. I grew up in a town about 40 miles away from Los Angeles called Riverside, California. That's where that journey of falconry began. It was a diverse neighborhood, a lot of single moms, my mom included, and it could sometimes be rough. And like any other kid, you had to pick and choose what crowd you wanted to hang out with. My younger brother lost his life through, through violence and, and, and was shot. Over, uh, over some drug deals my brother wasn't even involved in. It was, it was pretty fucked up, man. It was, and I was fortunate enough to put myself around friends that didn't choose to go that path. The teachers would always bring it to my attention to tell me I couldn't do something because of who I am and the color of my skin. I should be a garbage man or buy a couple of lawnmowers and cut lawns. I just pushed that shit that people were telling me that I couldn't do away. I just wanted to be outside, man. 
Growing up, I always had pigeons, and I watched a Cooper's hawk kill one of my pigeons, and, I, and, and it, it bummed me out, but it was also cool. And what's interesting is that at that young age, I knew that was part of nature. When I was eight years old, some kids found a red-tailed hawk out in the street, and they brought it to me, and I raised this bird. I would walk 10 miles away from my home and find abandoned fields and flush out gophers and my red tail would catch them. Walking in, in traffic through the city with this bird on my fist. Their hunting ability is phenomenal. They're designed for that rapid chase, the stoop. Peregrine Falcon can dive over 200 miles per hour, probably even faster. There's just so much to them that, that make them incredible predators. The Falcon is built for speed, so you'll see the pointed wings. You'll see the more sleek, body shape. Their eyes are phenomenal. They can see maybe eight to ten times better than a human. They typically strike their prey with an open foot or they use a talon to rake the prey. They're a well-designed predator, so much so that military oftentimes try to design fighter planes based upon their anatomy. Most people think that falconry started 4,000 years ago in Central Asian Plateau, Persia, Middle East, and then transitioned to China, Japan, Mongolia. The villagers use these birds to get food. A lot of these countries, they've been practicing falconry before they were actually using guns. Falconry was introduced to the U.S. through the European falconers. In Europe, it's all these grouse moors and things like that. you got to be a wealthy person either to own a grouse moor or to lease it for a couple of months so you can fly your birds there. It's a much different world in the United States. And we have these wide open spaces and all this BLM land. Where else in the world can you go and catch a prairie chicken or catch a pheasant or a duck on public land? That's what led me to the Eastern Sierras. It's like be a kid in a candy store. I just knew right away that I was never going to leave here. They had rodeos here in Bishop at the time, and I went to one of these classes and learned how to fight bulls. summertime, I would do all the rodeos I could and save money. So during the falconry season, which is the winter time, I would be able to travel the country. I knew that I was going to be a falconry bum. I was going to do whatever I could to expose my birds to all the different types of game in different states. I slept in my car. I slept in laundromats. I slept in a post office for three days. I ate Taco Bell for two and a half weeks one time, and I didn't think twice. It's all for the birds. You done? These pens are a collection of falconry meets that I attended over the years from our national club and then our state club. I don't collect them anymore because I don't attend falconry meets anymore. I've had a couple of run-ins and some scary moments when I was traveling with my birds. I have to remember, I'm a black man going into communities that some of these people never even met. The only time they see a black person is on TV. Being a young falconer and 
going to these falconry meets and doing well, there were some people that just didn't like it, just being the person that I am. Some guy stole one of my falcons. And in my state club, a guy walks up to me and starts poking me in my chest, calling me a nigger. I'm always looking over my shoulder. I have to worry about where I go with my birds. I have a hard time dealing with it sometimes. I really don't want to spend too much energy defending myself because if I do, then it reflects on how my birds perform. Shit. I gotta fix those feathers. That's really bad. A bird with broken feathers shows bad falconry management. I'm a believer that it's always the falconer's fault. I'm sorry. One feather on a falcon could make the difference between life and death. Birds are relying on you to care for them. And when you, I feel like I let my bird down. of prep and then praying that this works. Me living in a rural area, it's really hard for me to get the vet care. So over the years, even as a kid, I just learned to do a lot of the things myself. One of the things I like to teach falconers that are just getting into falconry, the first thing you do is you learn what's best for the hawk. Falconers had an incredibly positive effect on conservation. In the 1960s, the peregrine falcon population was plummeting all over. Falconers were the ones who noticed. See, there's that Kestrels right there. Yvonne, see it? We'd go up to the top of this thing, and finding an anchor was a problem, because there's no trees and stuff up there. So. I climbed down to that eyrie, and I came down with some broken eggshells. They referred to the peregrine eggs as hot, with contaminants, DDT, DDE, deodorum, which kills the birds like peregrines outright. DDT affected the female birds' calcium production when they're laying eggs. They crack under the weight of the mother incubating. These birds just were not producing enough young to replace themselves. Falconers were just constantly experimenting. They would watch a peregrine iry, and as soon as they'd laid eggs, they'd climb up and take the eggs. Because if they sat on it, they would probably crush the eggs. So it'd steal the eggs, put some dummy eggs in. They'd take the eggs away from the parents so they'd lay more and they'd hatch them in incubators and then they knew just how long they could safely feed them by hand before putting them back with the parents. A falconer back east bred peregrines for the first time. And falconers had the expertise to handle these birds. They were bringing back endangered raptors all over the world. From harpy eagles, falcons in Guatemala, the Mauritius kestrel and the California condor. It was a real success. They probably learned a lot about rewilding from the peregrine. You start talking about the recovery of the peregrine falcon, more rock always comes up. It's amazing to me that now there are two peregrine iris on Morro Rock. Right. Like, it was like one of only two in California in the 70s. So it's, you know, and now uh, there's two right here. Falconers basically saved the day with 
without falconers, it would have been very difficult to have a peregrine recovery like we have that. So you go all over the world with this, huh? Yeah. You sure you don't want to fly here, man? No, I want to see the master do it. There are several people in America who are really at the top of their game as long-wing falconers, you know, game hawkers. And Sean's right up there. He's become world famous in a way. He's the closest thing we have to an ambassador. We welcome Sean here in Hungary for the International Falconry Meeting. Falconry is 4,000 years old, and I'm very happy that you are one of these persons who keep falconry alive. There's the pheasant by the side of the road. Oh, yeah. Oh, you got it. I feel like I'm more wanted in other countries than I am in my own. That's the biggest eagle I think I've ever seen. Yeah. Sean is amongst the best falconers I've flown with. He's extremely inventive, a great example of modern American falconer living history. People recognize who he is and what he brings to the table. I began to hunt my birds on the most difficult quarries. It's all about the flight. I've seen him at international falconry festivals, give lectures, and people flock to his lectures. I have the opportunity to travel the world as a falconer, and it's a pleasure to be in Europe for not only the falconry, but for the people and the culture. Certainly, Sean is an ambassador for the outdoors. When young people of color see Sean around the world, they're like, I could do that. Falconry has helped me learn to be a lot more aware of my surroundings. My second passion, fishing, and falconry are both connected. All the different species of game birds that I catch, a lot of these feathers are used to tie flies to catch fish. One of my favorite things to do is releasing the fish. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to catch you. To let it go was just my way of actually enjoying that experience. I think about it every day that I'm able to do something that has been practiced for thousands of years. It's actually helped make me not only a better falconer, but it's actually, I think, helped make me a better person. When I go out and trap a bird, once we build that relationship for a season or two, when I release it, I know that bird is gonna be a good hunter and it's gonna survive. raptors are really capable of doing. That's how incredible they are.
All right, so that was the end of the film. Um, it, I've seen this film now probably like at least three times and it's just it's just blows me away every time. It's just so gorgeous, so gorgeously made. And uh, we get so many amazing shots of the birds and Sean doing his work in his element. So uh, we're gonna move on now to the Q&A portion of the night. I see that there are some questions in the Q&A, which is awesome. Um, so I'd love to welcome Sean to the Zoom room um, here. Uh, you can go ahead and turn your camera on and then I will uh, start with a couple questions that I had and then we'll uh, keep it going here. Okay. Hey. Hey, Sean, can you hear? hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, so could you explain uh, a bit more about the relationship between you and the falcons, the falcons you care for? Um, they seem to be to be free to fly away anytime you like. Is that right? At any time they like, I mean. Yeah. Um, they can fly any, away anytime they, they want, but it has to be pretty uh, it has to be a, a bad situation in order for them to want to do that. that um, and that's just based on the relationship you have with each falconer has with the bird. But yeah, they, they do have the ability and sometimes they do fly away. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And that um, actually, there was one question in the Q&A that may be related. So Sunny asks, uh, well, she says, they said, uh, thank you for sharing your experience and journey. I'm curious if one species is harder to care for or train than another. Could you repeat that again? Sure. Um, Sunny's curious to know if one species of uh, falcon or raptor is harder to care for or train than another. I wouldn't say that um, they would be more difficult to train there um, because hawks and falcons are different, but there's, there, there would just be different um, training methods that you would use to uh, to train each bird. And so it all depends on uh, actually on, on each and individual bird because most birds are all birds are all, all going to be different. But as far as it being difficult. Um, it's all difficult, but you should have different techniques and different methods that you would um, produce to and, and introduce and build relationships with different birds. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, and would you mind uh, turning on your camera if you can? I think some of the audience members would also love to see. I did, and it wouldn't let me because of something on, on your end. You can't ah. start your video because the host has stopped ah. I it. See. I think I know what is wrong. Hold on one sec. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Here we go. How about now? Yeah, there we go. Okay, awesome. Yay, okay, awesome. And um, similarly, Kelly Rosenheim um, asks, uh, how many birds do you uh, keep at a, at one time? I keep no more than two. Two is probably the, the 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 most I would have. Having more than three, mm -hmm. is it just um, would be a lot of work and yeah, um, because you're you're actually going out there hunting and spending the time to develop each bird. Mm -hmm. or one of the birds is going to be put on the back burner. You won't have enough time. So, uh, two two birds is is the most that I personally uh, handle. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um. We have another question that actually is something I was wondering as well. Um, what was your process for trapping your first wild bird and how did you choose a species? The process is is locating the birds and finding out the you know the, the, the specific bird that I want. And in that the first in that case, it was a uh, it was a red tailed hawk. And so mm -hmm. I had to figure out and go to an area where the birds are, were going to be migrating and where they were going to have the, the areas to hunt. And so once I 
I found in an area where the red tail was going to be, um, I went and trapped it. And what was the second part of the question? Oh, uh, that, uh, how did you choose a species? Or did it choose you? In fact? <laughs> you, in the, um, as being a, an apprentice falconer, that's a falconer who's in the early stages of training, you're only allowed to have a certain type of bird. And in my case, it was a red-tailed hawk. And so we're only allowed to have um, uh, immature red-tailed hawks. And so we go out and we trap those birds and we have those birds, the immature birds, because if you decide that you don't want to do falconry anymore, you can release that bird back out into the wild and that bird would have a, a, a better chance of, uh, of living. Um, whereas if um, I was to get a bird from the nest, then I would be stuck with that bird. So having an immature bird um, that is already somewhat knows how to hunt and how to live, but still young enough to where I can develop a relationship with it to teach it how to hunt is actually pretty much the law. So, if, you know, if I have to move or if I have to, uh, I don't want to do falcon anymore, I know I can release that bird and it's going to have somewhat of a chance um, to continue to survive. And they don't want you to use uh, the, the, the adult birds because you're taking birds from the wild that are already producing young. And so, um, you don't want to take the the adult birds, and it's actually actually pretty difficult to train the adult birds because they they they're already adults. They've already been through the process, and it's like the old saying: it's kind of trying to teach an old dog new tricks. It can be done, but in the practice of falconry, uh, for a beginner, it can be somewhat difficult. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, similarly, uh, it's a related question. Annie uh, Barry, who's yeah. one of our amazing bird guides. Um, asks, um, is there ever an issue with gaming hawks' behavior after release, as in they're being too used to people? Um, not in my case, because the birds that, that I, I develop are usually birds from the wild, or they're birds from a breeding project that um, were raised by their parents. Those are called chamber birds. Whereas if you had an imprint, a bird that was hatched and you hand raised it, it would imprint on you. And um, there have been cases where some of these birds have flown away and um, and flew to people because that's what it knew. And so, yeah, in some cases, but for the most part, um, some birds actually turn wild pretty quick because that's, that's really actually what they do. But as far as the birds that I have, I train and develop my birds um, for that reason, just in case they, they want to be released in the wild or if they do decide they don't want to be with me, I, I know that those bird, those specific birds are going to be um, well-developed and, and, and have the mindset to, be, to live on their own. Yes. Yeah. Oh, also, I wanted to say that um, for everyone in New York or even just, yeah, in the East Coast, uh, red-tailed hawks. Can you see me okay? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, I think everyone does too. If you can't, please let us know in the okay. chat. But um, uh, just to uh, mention that Sean mentioned the uh, red-tailed hawks, and that is one of the common, probably one of the most common raptor species we see in the city. We have plenty that are just all over. They eat the rats, they eat squirrels, pigeons. Um, so they're very used to city life here as well. Um, okay. I would love to know um, if you could share an anecdote with us of one of your favorite moments when flying your falcons. Um, I know you've mentioned in the past that you've had a few favorite individual birds, right? Yeah. Um, what is it you want to know? What did, did you? Yeah. So, uh, like, what was? Was there any I, particular there's, moment there's so that many different was? Things in them. Yeah. Was there any particular moment that was uh, just? very memorable or you're, you're uh, very meaningful to you? Yeah, um, probably as a, um, as a licensed falconer would probably have to be when I took my first um, wild head of game with my bird. I mean, I, I did that before I became a licensed falconer as a child. But when I became a licensed falconer and I knew the correct process of being a falconer, 
and um, learned more and knew that there was more to what I was doing, I would probably have to say the first time I caught a rabbit with a with, with a red tail hawk. And there's there's so, so many just just the fact that I'm having a relationship with a wild animal and able to watch it do what it's naturally going to do anyway is uh is probably you know I, I still get uh, an enjoyment out of that today mm -hmm. yeah yeah and um this is something that's very related to our work too and it comes to uh making nyc more bird friendly but um pesticides and like rodenticides for example is something that is very uh dangerous for birds lots of wildlife, but especially birds since they, many of them like raptors eat rodents. And so we have a question here saying, um, I think when hunting, are you ever concerned with pesticides or animal control poison affecting your bird? Or, and has that happened? No, no, um, I, I, I am concerned about pesticides more so in the wild birds than I am uh, with my particular birds because I'm flying a um, uh, uh, in, in a controlled environment. But um, uh, yeah, I will say that um, there are certain ducks during a certain time of the year that my falcons catch, I won't allow them to eat. And the reason that is, is because a lot of the ducks that I hunt like late in the mid season are migrating ducks. And a lot of those ducks are stopping at water treatment centers that have a lot of chemicals in them that, um, that can affect uh, your falcon or your hawk if it, if it is caught. So pesticides, I, I, I guess that can, you know, fall into the same environment. Yeah, so th there are things. And um, we, I, I found that out with that happens with a lot of birds. You know, there's a lot of birds in the city. A lot of the uh, city peregrines um, get sick because they're feeding on the birds that are drinking water out of chemical plants that are in the city. And gas stations with contaminated water and antifreeze and so um we are keeping an eye on on the pesticides as well because they are still using pesticides in other countries so you know when i when i'm out with my birds i'm always paying attention to you know the environment and if i see a dead bird on the ground is it the bird flu or, or is it a bird that was contaminated on its migration through my area. So yes, it, it, it plays a major role and it's something that most falconers as well as birders um, that are that are aware are paying attention to. And I think we all should. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, and that's definitely a, an issue, especially in a big city like New York, um, rodenticides. I mean, like any New Yorker will tell you about rats in the city. So um, when there are so many uh, so much call for like using rodenticides that can harm the birds that live here, including red-tailed hawks, peregrine falcons, owls. Um, yeah, so we're trying to work on that to minimize that, minimize that damage. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, um, in I, uh, you mentioned in your film how um, obviously like uh, this kind of role being a falconer is not something you commonly see. Um, in the black in the black community, and um, and you mentioned that uh, when in your uh, when traveling, you might the the uh, any kind of racism that you feel might actually be um, stronger in the U.S. than abroad. Um, can you elaborate a bit on that? And uh, this ties into a question Vivian asked as uh, um, as you travel to the country the country now. Do you find that you are more accepted as a black falconer? Oh, I um, you know what I, I I'm accepted as a uh, as a really good falconer because I know I am and and I'm not ashamed of that. What I'm not accepted as being a good black falconer because the the experiences that I've had they're so there's they come from so many different directions and so um. I just learned to pick and choose how I tell those stories because they're my stories. Um, but they're, they're the people's problems who have their problem with me being a good black falconer. Right. Um, I do now feel 
more welcome outside of the falconry community. I mean, doing these um, and building the relationships I am with all these uh, people in the birding communities, the Sierra Clubs and the Audubon Society and all the different organizations in, in wildlife. Um, I feel that I'm uh, accepted a lot more. Um, not that I don't have a lot of friends um, that, you know, I collaborate with falconers. There's awesome, there's, there's some really good people that I still um, associate with, but as far as me being in organized clubs and uh, um, or anything like that, um, um, uh, it, it really has made me change my way of thinking and how I practice. It didn't change me the way I practice my falcon, but it changed my way of thinking mm -hmm. um, of how I go about practicing my falconry. Because the people that I've had experiences with and continue to have experiences with, uh, um, they can't fault me for my falconry because I'm good at this shit. And so they, they don't have anything else. So they have to use the color of my skin. Mm -hmm. And they can't um, go after my character because I live in my character and I'm a good person. I'm a better person than I am a falconer and I'm a really good falconer. So I've learned to just kind of like um, uh, go with the flow and take it and understand that there are some people that aren't gonna really like it, but I, I, I can't let that control me. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's a conversation and that needed to be brought more. But other than that, I don't really, really care. You know, I fought bulls for mm -hmm. 22 years exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I saved lives. That was my job. I was cowboy protection fighting bulls. And in doing so, I never really had any problems. And you want to know why? Because when I'm out in that arena protecting those cowboys, that bull doesn't give a shit what color I am. The bull rider doesn't care what color. Around because he knows I'm out there to save his life. And my birds look at me the same way. They don't care what color I am. And it's always the uninformed people or the people who have their own inner problems who have that kind of problem. My birds do well because I give them the confidence and let them believe that anything I flush under them, they can kill because that's what I, that's what they do. They're not out there as, as pets. So um me being a black man and a good falconer that I am, I've learned over the years to not even let that shit bother me because I'm I'm continuing to do well. And there's other people out there that um, are willing to listen and share the ideas and stories that I have. Nice. Yes. Oh my God, I love that. There's so much in there that um, I think like so many people of color in the wildlife field, especially, I mean, including myself, like I resonate with so much. It's kind of like, I think a lot of us can um, probably attest to the fact that uh, we want to like excel in our, like by by like doing our work and like excelling in our work, like that's, that speaks for us, you know? Um, yeah, I love that. And uh, uh, a related question from Ed, um, are there any programs led by black indigenous or other people of color that are introducing this practice to younger BIPOC adults in big cities? If that you know of, no, not not consciously. You know, uh, 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 my friend Rodney Stout. He lives back east. I, I keep forgetting where he lives, but he has a, a program where he introduces uh, the young people of color in his community and lets them know um, about the falconry that he practices. But as far as there being a set program. Um, there, there isn't, unfortunately, but you know, the, Not you know, yet. the um, kids aren't smart and through the programs that I've, kids aren't, kids aren't stupid. They're, they're, they're pretty smart. And through the programs that I have been doing and the stories that I've shared with some of the kids and some of the inner cities and kids of color, um, the emails that I get, the return email get, that I get and messages that I get, I can see that you know, going a little forward. We have, we still have a lot of work to do um, in regards to doing that. But I think with what we, what you and I are doing, um, this um, is, is, is somewhat helping. And um, I'm, I'm living proof of that. Mm -hmm. And it's well received in the birding community because I was a birder before I was a falconer. If I wasn't a birder interested in birds, 
um, before I was a falconer, there would be, there's no way I would be at the level I am now. The, the, the birds that I've learned um, about having at a young age is what, what taught me uh, falconry. And I can get into that a little more. I don't know if we have time, but I learned more about birds um, than I did about falconry. Mm. Yeah, First. I mean, I love that. Yeah, right. I totally agree. I think any kind of um, uh, program or event that like just has the really expose it to more, provides more exposure um, for all people to just engage um, with uh, like people who are in the wildlife field, people of color in the wildlife field that really like advances the movement, I think. Um, and yes, we do have some time for a little uh if you wanted to expand on that, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I do. I, I I don't. It's it's such a good top topic. If if and if I talked about it more, I would I'd have a lot clearer mind. But I'm trying to give myself time to think because it's I don't want to make any mistakes because it means so much to me. But um, I use my falconry as a path to introduce to the kids of color that it's okay to go outside, go pick up a pine cone, go learn to fish because all of that will fall into place. As long as you're outside and paying attention and looking down and looking up and wanting to learn why that tree is growing there or why those birds nest in that tree and why those birds and bugs are doing what they're doing i think that is the path that we need to lead um down for the kids of color you know i've i've gone to schools and talked to kids that have never seen a pine cone that have never seen a fish never seen the snow or you know and and um, a pine needle and that has to change and uh, I'm doing my, my my part. And as I look on social media and I see all these different groups, it's good to see that these, these groups are introducing some of these young kids of color to fishing, uh, more important, so birding. You know, it's it's really cool to see what, you know, to see what you guys are doing. I'm in the falconry community, but I'm also not involved in any set kind of groups. And I think it's because I, I am isolated but I, I i do pay attention and it's really good to see some of these organizations of the people of color introducing these kids to let them know that it, it's okay for them to go outside and to learn about the environment and culture yeah mm -hmm. you can do that in the city you know and um yeah and so it's it's it's, it's really good we're, we're we have a lot of work to do but it's like a, um, i don't want to sound like a broken record but it's good to see what you're doing and outdoor afro and seeing how all these burning autobahn uh, uh collaborating with all these different groups to to make everybody aware and i think it's a win-win situation you know falconry has gotten me to where i'm able to do a lot of things and and, and produce and so i do whatever i can to give back to help mm -hmm. oh yeah oh preach <laughs> i love that yeah i think i think yeah it's very evident yeah you are doing the work you are making a positive uh change in this world and yeah, that is so such a great point that you brought up. It's just like, especially in a big city and in an urban space, um, a lot of people may not have um, the ex uh, experience of of being with wildlife, and and especially in a in a city like New York, not everyone has uh, equal access to green space. So that's been um, some of my priorities here as the public programs manager to make sure we do those events in those neighborhoods, um, uh, offer this kind of programming to people um that don't that may not have otherwise have those opportunities um so yeah absolutely totally agree with that, you on that um and unfortunately we are almost at the out of time we are almost <laughs> at the top of the hour um which is just such a shame because i feel like i could keep talking for hours but i know you can too um but thank you so yeah. so much for speaking with us tonight sean um your passion for birds is palpable and your work helps uh the concert with conservation and wildlife education for people and people of color, especially everywhere. Um, 
to everyone watching, we are currently in our winter season of programs. So be sure to check out the bird outings that we have planned on our calendar all over the city, especially in places like I was mentioning um, that may not have a lot of this kind of programming or access to green space. So I'm gonna put that in the chat right now. And uh, you may be able to spot several species of raptors that live in past through New York City, including peregrine falcons, red-tailed hawks, merlins, and more. Um, and if you like this lecture, don't forget to join us next month for our fourth of the series, Empowering Youth in Climate Action with Ajani Stella on Tuesday, February 6th. I will put that in the chat right now again so you can register for that. And I know we have some questions in here that we didn't get to, but I'm sure, um, Sean, uh, would do you would you be willing to um, provide your email or anything so people can reach out to you? Where can people reach out uh, to you or find you online or anything? They can reach out to me at Sean, and my email is um, Sean Hayes Falk. Sean Hayes Falk. S-H-A-W-N-H-A-Y-E-S at gmail.com. And I also have... Uh, two social media uh, yes. pages that I don't run. I, I kind of get on them, but I have somebody helping me with them. Sean mm -hmm. H. Falconry on Instagram. Yes. And okay. yeah, and if they send me questions, it might take me a while to get back because I'm, I'm, I travel a lot, but um, I do my best to uh, respond on to some of the questions and, and um, help, you know, whenever I can on, on all aspects. And I would just like to say that um, another thing that um, I would like to see the uh, people of color, especially the young generations is, you know, get as much books as you can. And when you're out consciously looking to learn about birds or anything, it's a really good thing to jot it down in a journal. I'm, 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 I'm really big on journaling and taking photos now. Mm -hmm. And um, it really pays a, a, a big role in regards to what I'm doing now. So Anyway, thank you for having me. And um, if you need to contact me, you have my information. Yeah, of course. No, thank you so much. Love journaling. That's a great activity to do and great for just your own, for anyone's like own enjoyment and also uh, uh, just the recording of everything that you see. So I have put in the chat Sean's email and Instagram in case you want that information, everyone. Um, and yeah, this was really great. I wish these lectures sometimes could be two hours instead of just one hour, but um, well, we got to leave it for <laughs> there. But um, so thank you all so, so much for joining us tonight and we'll uh, see you next time. Have a good night. See ya.